You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Went to a wedding yesterday, Mark, which is not something I do very often. It's very exciting, isn't it? Uh, it's very nice wedding reception in uh, in Gospel Oak in, in North London. And uh, and the first thing the groom said to me ex- excitedly was, uh, we got a group, we got a band, and they're an ABBA tribute group. <laughs> and I said, Fantastic. do you realise today is the 50th anniversary of ABBA, the advent of ABBA, when they won the Eurovision Song Contest? in Brighton you didn't know at all but perfect I, timing I do think it was absolutely extraordinary you know, that, that that if you tell people in a wedding reception in, in, in the 21st century that we've got to have a tribute group they just think well great that it's the complete package don't they because mm-hmm. ABBA is I can't think of anything that kind of la- has lasted as long as the idea of ABBA you know what I mean it's kind of bigger now than it's ever been at any well, point has it and and now universal affection not the case back in the day. <laughs> Let's possibly not. Forget, not. Possibly it's interesting. Not. Do you remember? So it's it was so. What is it? April April six. April six, nineteen seventy four. I remember it really vividly. Did you watch it at the time? No, I didn't watch it. No, because I was far too um, cool, long haired, and bedenimed. And you were far too involved in the Atlanta rhythm section or something <laughs> to have watched it. But I was very aware of it, you know. And uh, uh, do you remember we talked to Carl Magnus Palm? Yep. Uh, about two years ago for a podcast. Who's the kind of Mark Lewis and of Abba? He's a Mark Lewis really and Abba world. Yes. Yeah, and he's written these fantastic books about them. And so I was, I was remembering that conversation we had and the things he told us, because the, the, the key thing was that they were very big. I mean, they were individual superstars in 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 um, Sweden, weren't they? You know, the uh, the, the Hep stars and the Hoot Nannies and the two girls have both been uh, solo stars. But they hadn't, they, and they were big in Sweden. They weren't enormous, but his whole thing, the the the, the, ca- the the campaign was to break out of Sweden and become international stars. And they put all this effort into the Eurovision, didn't they? Do you remember they tried to get in the year before in 1973 with a song called Ring Ring? Oh, yes, And they course. really worked it out. They said, we're going to have a three-syllable title <laughs> and it's going to be internationally understandable and they came up with a, the original song was called honey pie and they thought wait well, we can't do that because there's a Beatles song called honey pie and then they came up with waterloo waterloo the battle place the battlefield in in, in belgium that will work and everyone will understand it we're going to do the song in english so it's got you know massive appeal and the things he told us i remember one was that about their stage clothes which he said that in sweden at that time there was a sort of tax dispensation wasn't there on stage clothes to encourage people to produce kind of theatrical costumes, to encourage the world of theatre, really. So therefore, you were given unlimited funds to develop stage wear as long as it couldn't be used in everyday use, because otherwise you'd just be getting the state to pay for your clothes. So you had to come up with stage wear that could not be worn off stage, which is why they came up with those extraordinary things. Do you remember she's wearing the, Agnetta's wearing the blue satin knickerbockers with the skull cap and the, and the silver boots. Do you remember that? And the, and the, and the boys are wearing their kind of Regency ruffs. You know, it's all beads and uh, preposterous boots. And uh, yeah, I was just looking at a little clip last night, and David Vine is the sport. David player. Vine. This is pre Terry Wogan. It is really. It's quite interesting. It's pre kind of. It's pre camp, isn't it? Really, you know. Yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. It's just very straight BBC presentation, isn't yeah. it? And and well, it's not strictly BBC. I suppose it's probably done by the Euro uh, broadcaster or whatever. The, I, don't, I don't know. It, what strikes me is it's quite clunky TV presentation, isn't it? It's Katie Boyle doing the. Katie Boyle, yeah. She is the kind of the MC. And as you say, David ba- uh, David Vine introduces them as uh, as the ABBA group, the as ABBA if he's group. as if he's not used to the idea the of a group, group just being called ABBA. You know, uh, uh, as simple as that. And, they and when they get uh, on, Bjorn is introduced as Born. That's uh, right. yeah. And then they come on, and it's as if the camera. It's as if there's been no proper camera rehearsal because the camera just entirely focuses on the two girls. Yeah. And you don't see the two guys until later on in the performance. And there's all sorts of things which don't really um, make any sense to me. The, the introduction of the 
And the musical director, which was then a tradition of the of the way Eurovision was done, it is comes every, on dressed as Napoleon. Comes on dressed as Napoleon. Yeah. So everybody has their kind of, um, you know, their conductor who comes over. And you think, who's he conducting, for goodness sake? This is, you know, it's a pop group, you know. And I don't know if they're... Also, they're, everything's pre-recorded apart from the girls' vocal. Apart from, it certainly I don't, I don't sounds the, like I don't even think the male vocal is live. It's just the two girls' scene. Yeah, That's the only yeah. thing that's live. But David Viner just forgot there's a bit where they, they come on, he says, like, if the judges were men, uh, yeah, if all yeah, the yeah. judges were men, this lot would get a lot of votes, and you'll see why in a moment. <laughs> in a moment. <laughs> and you're expecting them to come on in those kind of, you know, barely dressed at all. But actually, they're very modestly attired. I know. know. I it's know. kind of, it's before, the, it's before the arrival of the kind of sex bomb in popular music, isn't it, Rick? Yeah. It's, it's obviously before the, the arrival of video and so forth. It's also, and I was just looking at this, the perfect time for Abbott to to arrive uh, because, by God, popular music was at a pretty low ebb. If you look at the UK charts... Oh, it's appalling. ...in the week. It's I'm going to read sweet. you the top it's, it's, ten. Yeah, go on. I'm going to read yeah. you the top ten from the week that... Um, that ABBA did Waterloo on the Eurovision Song Contest. Number 10, Seven Seas of Rye by Queen. Then uh, The Most Beautiful Girl in the World by Charlie Rich. The Cat Crept In by Mud. Yeah. You are everything by Dinah Ross and Marvin Gaye. Hot Chocolate, Emma by Hot Chocolate. Angel Face by The Glitter Band. Every Day by Slade. Remember Me This Way by Gary Glitter. Billy Don't Be a Hero, Hero by Pabellis. Yeah. And, of course... Um, the resident at the top of the charts at the time, Seasons in the Sun by Terry Jacks. It's pretty uninspiring. It's stuff. <laughs> but also, I haven't. I mean, they actually we're recording this on the Sunday, and they're showing the whole program uh, tonight on the on the BBC. There's a nice piece by Alexis Petridis in the Guardian yesterday, talking about the rest of the the act, and he says that the rest of the acts are terrible because they are a real throwback. It's all cabaret and it's yeah, yeah. par, you know. So actually, their song and the way they looked and the way they arranged it, everything, everything about them really stood out it really did look like it was kind of forward leaning you know yeah but, and i suppose you, you play that record 50 years later and it still sounds fantastic yeah. still sounds the, the way it did at the time whereas if you played anything else uh, you know from that uh, that contest it wouldn't it wouldn't stand up in the same no, way olivia newton john was it long 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 live love was it was our entry i can't remember joined fourth Joint interesting fourth. part fact, Britain gave them no points. They didn't I don't think they actually gave them no points, but you're only allowed to vote for ten acts and they voted for ten acts, not including Sweden. So that's interesting. But one thing I'd forgotten and, and that um Carl Magnus Palm reminded us of was that at the time you know, you thought that was the big breakthrough, and it was. You know, they had an international hit. But firstly, Sweden turned against them. Do you remember that? There's an yeah, interview yeah, yeah. with them directly yeah. after the show. And the Swedish reporter says to Stig, Stig the, the, the manager and co-writer of the song, actually, uh, and Frida, he says, um, he says, last year you made a song about people phoning each other, which was Ring Ring, and this year you did a song about how 40,000 people died. <laughs> it's kind of, really kind of like woke attitude to the whole thing. And they were absolutely furious. And the same thing happened in Britain because, in fact, there was huge coverage and everyone was going on about, you know, the two married couples. It was all just impossibly fabulous and Bjorn and Agnetta had just had a baby and there was something incredibly wholesome about them and there was Sweden and it was dairy product and all that. But actually the press thought they were immensely... The, the music press ignored them completely, the music press, well, which is an irony because actually the music press were tied up with sweet and uh, mud and the, the glitter band, as we were saying. But the, the actual the mainstream press kind of generally gave the impression that they were preposterously naff. And you forget that, you know, that when it happened, everyone thinks, oh, ABBA, it was all wonderful and we loved them straight away. No, we didn't. For 18 months, the UK did not buy into their follow-up singles. And they talked in the to in, in the book that we were talking about, about how they come back on tour each time. And it started off in Rolls Royces and then it was Daimlers. And then they were pretty much down to Ford Cortinas and terrible little hotels. It was going really badly. And it wasn't until SOS that they actually had another hit and came back. And from that point, and then Dancing Queen in 1976, and it kind of took off. And the other thing I didn't know was the revival. The revival, though for 10 years, nothing really happened. No one talked about ABBA at all. They were just generally considered to be cheesy and something we ought to forget and we're a bit embarrassed about. 
And then there was a club, I think, called the Bar Industrial in Hanover Square. And Boy George and George Michael and Erasure and various people used to DJ, and they used to play ABBA songs every night. And that encouraged the record company to put out ABBA Gold in 1992. And then it all, from that point, it all took off. And now we're in a position where we, we can't remember that anyone had anything but a good word to say about and now, it. And now it's absolutely standard at weddings in the, oh, in, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in the 21st century, you know, where, where the most of the people at the wedding, I couldn't help thinking of this as the Abba Tribute group, you know, piped up, you know, that most of the people at the wedding are like 35 to 40 or something. Yeah. Like, and we're not born, but, you know, born don't, even remember, don't even remember the first revival or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just absolutely astonishing. And um, I've just been looking at the Sunday Times, the front page of the Sunday Times, from the day after Abba's triumph in um, in April 1974. And the amazing thing is... They go, they're a tiny little news item on the bottom of the bottom left. But one of the big, big news stories is 14 incendiary bombs had gone off in shops in the, in the, in, in, in the London area, largely in the London area, you know, Wembley and Welling Garden City and Edmonton and so forth. And I'm not sure anybody knows to this day who, you know, there, was, there were no injuries, but 14 incendiaries. <laughs> It's absolutely, it's classic. That's 70s nostalgia for you, isn't it? You know, that was, that was the reality of everyday life at the time. Now, the other thing I wanted to recall um, on that particular day, something that took place, you know, in a different country, might as well have been a, a different universe on, on the, the same, same day, wasn't it? On the same day was the California Jam yeah. took place at um, Ontario Speedway. It was a, a racetrack out in the out in the Californian desert. And um, ABC Television paid for uh, the promotion of a, of a major rock festival. It decided they wanted a big rock festival. And so they started off... They they signed Earth, Wind and Fire, I think. They signed Seals and Crofts. And they Eagles, signed the Eagles. Black Oak, Arkansas. The, and then but then it built up from that. And obviously somebody thought we've got to get some big hitters in here to really sell tickets to to get kids to trek out into the into the broiling heat of the desert on a Saturday. Uh, and so we're gonna get three of those big limey acts. And so they got Black Sabbath, they got Deep Purple, Deep Purple. and they got Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. You know, that does All that, huge at the time. I mean, fantastic. The right does, to sign. Doesn't that make your heart sing, Mark, the idea that you're going to watch, you're going to watch Black Sabbath followed by Deep Purple, followed by um, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Black Sabbath... Um, had to go on in the afternoon. And there's something there's, about there's Black, Black Sabbath. Sabbath. Black Sabbath in the, in the daylight just doesn't seem right. Doesn't does really, it? doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work at all. And um, and then they were due to be followed by Deep Purple, who had the new members, uh, David Coverdale, had just joined as a singer to replace Ian Gillen, I suppose. Um and uh, Richard Blackmore decided that they weren't going to go on until, or he'd been promised, they weren't going to go on until the evening, until the dusk. And so he locked so the lights, himself. That's the old kind of Led Zeppelin at Bath Festival. Absolutely. Because you're going to look fantastic when the lights are on you. He, he, he locked himself in his trailer and refused to come out, you know. So there's poor sods out in the desert in the broiling heat. Weren't they and, an hour late or something? And they're at least yeah, an hour yeah. late. Uh, and so they went and on. And also, were there any screens? Because I looked at no. some of this footage. No. That's the thing that struck me. 250,000 people. 350,000. Sorry, 350,000. They're ranking 350,000. 350,000 people. And it's just, you you look at it, and it's just, the, it's the most colossal crowd. They're miles away. They say it's the loudest amplification system ever used. Not sure have to be. But the point is, there are no screens. And therefore, what on, a, and also, you know, 
Black Sabbath, I mean, much as we love them, but that is slow, <laughs> cumbersome music, isn't it? Which is oh. not going to engage you if you're three quarters of a mile away. You know? I don't know how anyone could have been entertained by it, but they were. Go on, anyway. And uh, then uh, Emerson Lake Palmer uh, went on, you know, and, and at this point, people must have been just been thinking, I want to get home to my bed or where's my car or whatever. Yeah. And But Emerson Lake Palmer... Didn't know uh, you, you don't have an abbreviated version of Emerson Lake Palmer, do you? You you either have the full the full serving, or you have nothing at all, and uh, therefore Fishes with Keith Emerson on his on his grand piano, revolving in midair, isn't he? <laughs> playing Re- it upside apparently down. Apparently, revolving in midair. Well, he is definitely revolving in midair, but he's not playing because it was an empty piano. It was a stunt piano, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But there is the poor soul being twirled around, you know, in a way that the, it is kind of a cruel and unusual punishment that people who want to go into outer space are put through, isn't it, if they, to acclimatise them. To but not us. forgetting that there's only a bit of the first 150 feet, you can actually see what's going on anyway. It's absurd. And there's, there's the Richie Blackmore guitar thing, which is amazing. Richie Blackmore decides to smash his guitar up. And in a very kind of, again, ponderous way, goes to the back of the stage and dutifully carries on bits of amplification equipment to the edge of the stage and lobs it over into the pit, doesn't he? And then eventually throws the guitar into the crowd, which is absolutely astonishing. Imagine doing that today. Imagine throwing a guitar into the crowd. What kind of legal action you'd face? Absolutely. It's, um, you know, it, it's the most... Um it's the most appalling set spectacle in the entire history of rock and roll, actually, is is the California Jam. And if you, if you haven't seen it, it, of course, it's out there on YouTube. And, you know, go and uh, fill your boots. And uh, one little uh, footnote, which will enhance your viewing, is that David Coverdale, who was a singer and just had, had just joined Deep Purple, was reputedly doing the whole set while in his back pocket having a check for $1 million. That's right. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. It's 60 years ago this month since the release of the first Rolling Stones record, which, as you know, has is, is long been a favourite of mine. Uh, if people are not aware of this, this is the one with... Uh, it's all rhythm and blues covers, really. It's Muddy Waters and Jimmy Reed and Slim Harpo and Rufus Thomas and so forth, all knocked together in a demo studio in Denmark Street, just off Charing Cross Road, in about three sessions, I think, something like that. They, they always used to say it was, a, it was such a basic studio. It actually had egg boxes on the wall as insulation. Mm. Um, you know, it was it was hardly state of the art. It was just a place that people used to to make demos for publishers. But uh, Andrew Eldham did a deal with Decca Records where they it was an independent deal, really. So they, they didn't have to use the Decca Studios; they could go and do it in this place. And by some miracle, I don't know how it happened. You know. The results are just magical to me. You know, it's, it's, it's got a sound that, that nothing else has. And even when the Rolling Stones kind of went back there and did their second album, it wasn't as good. That first album just has an absolutely extraordinary sound to it. It's always been a favourite of mine. It was always the one that um, could get any party started in the 1960s. Yeah. You know? After the game of spin the bottle, they, <laughs> they would be frantic, frantic dancing and pairing off to the sound of walking the dog or Mona or whatever. Do you know what's just struck me for the first time this week? And I'm looking at the cover now. Because this was, you know, the cover was a huge statement in itself in that it didn't say the Rolling Stones on it. It didn't say didn't the have time. Name of the album. Didn't have a name of an album. It actually has a, a picture of the Rolling Stones standing side on in shadow. And then it has a, the Decca logo in the top right. But the amazing thing is, because they they look like relative ruffians as compared to the kind of the smiling face of the Beatles or Jerry and the Pacemakers or whatever. 
And uh, you looked at them and you thought, well, they're, they're a motley crew. But it's only when I look at it closely now, after 60 years, Mark, I realize something I've been missing for all of these 60 years. And this is it. Four out of five of the Rolling Stones on the cover of that epoch-making first album are wearing shirts and ties. <laughs> shirts and... Probably under gr- a great deal of uh, duress, actually. I don't know. Probably not. You see, what I'm going, so Brian's wearing them. Keith, Bill, Charlie, the only one who doesn't, who's gone so far as to have an open neck shirt is Mick Jagger. Um, and, you know, we forget just how revolutionary it was the fact that they weren't actually wearing a band uniform. A band uniform. That's the thing that struck me about it. Because the Beatles, the thing about the Beatles is, is that, I mean, obviously they wore uniforms on stage, didn't they? I mean, right, right the way through, they all wore matching suits or whatever. But if you look at those album covers, everything about those Beatles pictures suggests a kind of a democracy and a, a kind of unity, doesn't it? Uniformity. It's, it's kind of like one, uniformity, uh, 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 just four people together. You've got to see as one person. You've got the, the with the Beatles, the, with the roll necks, the hard day's night, black and whites, the sturdy winter wear on uh, help. Rubber sole, that picture, they look like they're the same person. Yeah. They're drawn together. You've got the, the drawings on revolver and on the back, they're all wearing exactly the same shades. You've obviously got the Sergeant Pepper suit. You've got the the um, Magical Mystery Tour uniform as well, and even kind of Abbey Road actually. Abbey Road, they're kind of wearing suits, aren't they? The oh, they are. Yeah. And yeah. so there's that sense that you always were invited to see the Beatles as as a group, as four people together. Whereas the Stones, that and also is so revolutionary that the Stones dressed differently in itself, wasn't it? That they oh, absolutely. They just went on. They were wore different colours, like different trousers, and different. Types of shirts that used to make that used to make the the business of looking at any photograph of the Rolling Stones absolutely fascinating. Yeah, if you go back and look at those, you know, those early pictures taken by Gareth Mankiewicz, we talked to on the podcast about this. You know, um, the, just looking at the detail of their shoes or their belts or their waistcoats or whatever. We think you look at it and think, God, I've never thought, never thought of having anything like that or wearing anything like that. You know, they were a kind of, they were a walking fashion statement. The yeah, Rolling Stones were. were five walking fashion yeah. statements. Uh, but it, and uh, you know, it's a way we've got used to, kind of, I suppose, indie bands dressing like that. Ever since, haven't we, really? You know, there's no expectation that if you see Coldplay that they'll be wearing a uniform. You'd expect yeah. them to be wearing... Oh, Blur's you, the best oh, example. Oh, Blur, uh, you know, yeah. They'd be wearing their own cho- choices, wouldn't they, really? Yeah. You know, that would be that would be part of the um, part of the messaging around them. Well, there's the other interesting thing. Thinking about bands in the 60s, So, you you know, bands of musicians always wore uniforms. Classical musicians wore uniforms. Jazz musicians wore uniforms. Pop groups did it. And uh, and that continued uh, for most of them through the 60s until the time it all changes. And it changes really radically. And you can see this so clearly if you go back and look at old music papers or you can look back at old album covers from 1967. Suddenly, suddenly, everybody is wearing fancy dress. Just sort of fake, you know, that's what they've done. After the Beatles, Sergeant Pepper, the Rolling Stones do it with their Stanic Majesties. Absolutely everybody else. You look at Procol Harum, I don't know. You yeah. look at the... Jethro Tull. <laughs> you look at anybody. It's fancy dress, yeah. you know I me. Mean? Somebody will be wearing a kind of um, a strange kind of Chinese moustache or something, you know. It's as if they really have raided the uh, the dressing up box of a, of a down-at-heel 
a repertory theatrical repertory company somewhere in in in, in the provinces of England, you know, and all decided to dress like that with no exceptions. You know what I mean? You don't see one holdout member of Progal Harem or family or I don't know who who's still wearing their old stuff. No. No, it's all or nothing. Absolutely. It's absolutely Not to all be the concept. Nothing. Everybody is in fancy dress for a period of about of about two years. It's absolutely an astonishing thing in itself. Uh, so the, there's the Stones' first album 60 years ago. Still sounds absolutely extraordinary. And do you know why? The thing that we often forget, it's all hits. It's not their hits, but it's all hits. It's Muddy Waters hits. It's Jimmy Reed hits. Slim Harpo hits. It's the best possible combination because it's songs you already know and like done by a band whose version of things you adore. So you're getting getting a stonesization of all these things that you, you really loved anyway. There it is. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. There's a good story about the Roald Dahl estate hiring uh, a load of famous people off the telly to come up with, with, with news, news stories featuring Roald Dahl characters. I mean, that's happened with James Bond. People have rewritten James Bond books, you know. And, uh, and we were talking about this uh, earlier and saying that uh, there's a possibility that somebody might do this one day with, with Beatles characters. You know, because there's lovely Rita, isn't there? And there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, you could do the, the further adventures of Mean Mister Mustard. I can oh, see, that. Yeah, I can see that yeah. working. You know, possibly as a cartoon book for kids. Um, the continuing story of Desmond and Molly Jones and that <laughs> but, Barrow in the marketplace. And bungalow, that, bungalow Bill. Bungalow Bill. It makes Eleanor Rigby, fa- Father McKenzie, Rose and Valerie, and the reconstitution. Cream in from the gallery. <laughs> It's good, isn't it? Vera, <laughs> Chuck, and Dave. I That's think these true. Are characters. These are characters you could bring in. Uh, you could write a series of country hits about a character called Rocky Raccoon. Contemporary, uh, a very contemporary one, I think, is Sweet Loretta Martin, who thought she was a woman, but she was another man. That's a theme that could be developed. And then there's Polythene, Pam, and Sexy Sadie, and Michelle, and various others. Why isn't it being done, Dave? Well, I did, well, because they're still with us, I suppose. But you know, we're rolled down, shuffle off this mortal coil. But there's still there's still companies who own those copyrights and are looking to you know to to extend their um, their commercial life. And one of the ways they do this is just here's a new thing featuring an old familiar property. Yeah. Uh, and well, the way they've done it with the Roald Dahl estate is they've gone to a load of people who are known off the telly, who suddenly do, do, suddenly apparently have the magical ability to invent fictional stories. Isn't that wonderful, Mark? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that Off the top amazing? of their heads. Yeah, absolutely. But anyway, you know, it will remain the case that the future will be in the past. And um, we were also talking about the fact, wasn't it? It's all anniversaries, isn't it? Is it 30 years since Kurt Cobain died? It, it is, is, isn't it? Yeah, almost exactly to the day, I think. Yeah. Good grief. And um and isn't that also doesn't isn't isn't the demise of of uh, of, uh, of Kurt Cobain pretty much the start of Britpop? Is that is that the that the case? Well that would be I think that's fair to say that was that 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 kind of brought down the rung down the curtain on grunge, didn't it? Right, right, right. But we were talking to Neil Tennant last week, our old pal from the Petrol Boys, who was on the Smash Hit staff in the early 80s, and we've just done a recording with him, which is going out next week, actually. And he made a really good point, I think, about how the 80s was the last... It was the last great era of forward-looking pop music. And he said that the 90s, meaning really Britpop, was when everything started to look back, and it was a, it was then going back to the Beatles and going back to the Stones and the Kinks and going back to the great sort of era of 60s pop and kind of rebooting it. I thought that was a good point, actually. And uh, and grunge, I suppose, to some extent, was was the final, you know, that's that, that, was, that was chucked out of the park, wasn't it, by the arrival of Oasis and Blur. And that, in, in a sense, was at least moving forward and, and looking into some kind of future. Yeah, it's funny because that, that was my main memory of Britpop was I thought to myself, I remember thinking of this at the time. It's the first 
movement in popular music I've ever been aware of where the prime movers seem to be saying it's all already been done. Yeah. <laughs> they seem to be saying we do what we can, but it's not quite as good as what we liked 20 years earlier. I, I never got the feeling that anybody in pop music had ever, had ever come forward like that. And like they did, uh, that that was the feeling. I can remember I got about some it. analyst at the time saying that uh, for pop music to be to, to get a hit, a certain percentage it was like sort of seventy percent of the song must somehow feel familiar. And if you applied that to Oasis, it's no surprise those things were hits because they were so familiar because they were all chord sequences that you had heard before. You might not be able to instantly recognise them, but there were things there. They're all part of your DNA. It's interesting, is it's fascinating, because also doesn't this also um, kind of go back to what we were saying earlier about ABBA, that you know the ABBA revival, I think is was triggered by, and I've got the dates in front of me. Erasure did an ABBA revival, didn't they? Well, Medley. they were part of that club that I was talking about. The oh yes, industrial. yeah, yeah. yeah. And they and, used to go on once a week and just do ABBA songs in a really camped up way, and it just became hugely popular. But but they had a hit with an ABBA tune, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they did. And and then, then round about the same time, you get the arrival of Bjorn again, who are the Australian ABBA, um, you know, tribute group. Yeah, who become enormously successful. And it, it does it does all tie into the idea, doesn't it? That that by the early nineties there was a general feeling, oh, oh, let's start again kind of thing. You know, could go back twenty years and people would have forgotten, uh, but it would at the same time feel familiar to them. And um and that's the world we've been living in ever it, since. No, it isn't is. it? And, and there's uh, something also about about periods of music that were so kind of apparently universally reviled coming back that makes it even sweeter when they're, they're, they're kind of um, reappraised. Because as I was saying earlier, you know, ABBA were just, it was so cheesy and so... Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's quite as simple as that. Yeah, and I was watching that, that um, BBC thing that they ran about, you know, Britain's kind of affair with ABBA, which is is interesting, you know, because the Brit- the British clearly have tamed ABBA to their hearts in a, way, in a way that not everywhere in the world would have done. And Stuart McKenney's on there, you know, Stuart's saying, well, Euro pop, pop was a bit of an insult uh, as a term in those days. Although it's very interesting when you watch those documentaries, they've all, they're all the same. You just take all the, all the bits of chat you had with people and you cut the bits in, 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 into tiny, tiny segments, and you put them all at the beginning to try and build your argument, you know what I mean? Because I can remember, um, I can remember, was it the visitors? I'm very bad at the chronology of ABBA, ABBA records. But I can remember Bob Woffenden, who at the time was the ed- reviews editor of The Enemy, uh, the lead review and the enemy when the visitors came out, I think it was the visitors, was a full page. Bob, you know, singing the praises of ABBA. So there would be people who would think they're very cheesy in Europe. But at the same time, there were also people who thought, had a rather chin stroking, you know, uh, attitude. Only towards the end. See, Abba, uh, the visitors were right at the very end, wasn't it? Oh, okay. Well, it wasn't. No, I think that this wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the visit. Okay. It wasn't the visitors. If you go back, there is, and I was there, it must have been yep. year 76 or whatever. There was a full page review of, a, of an Abba album in The Enemy, and I think it was written by Bob Waffender, which was very, um, very respectful. But you can't deny that in the early 70s, around the time of Waterloo, there was a sort of um, 
it was a kind of snobbishness, really. The, the, the British thought that they, they, it was their imperial phase was still going on. We kind of invented pop music in the, in the early 60s, still coasting on the back of the Beatles and everything like that. And there's a very dim view that no other European country could do it right. You would not take a German pop hit or a French pop hit or a Swedish pop hit or a, or a you know, Belgian pop hit seriously, don't you think? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, you, uh, but, you know, Abba, they went to number one in that chart. They they knocked Terry Jack's they, season true. in the sun off off the top of the chart. Not before you know, time. Yeah, you know, paper lace were no more. You know, <laughs> <laughs> once they happened, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's extraordinary, you know. Ever since then, it's been Abba's world, and we just live in it. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink, and it's like being in the pub. And we're joined by not one, but two birthday guests. We've got effectively a birthday party this week. <laughs> uh, okay. We're joined by Al. Say hello, Al. Hello, Al. How are you? And hey uh, say hello, Stephen. Hello, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> and you two, cha- you two chaps actually know each other, don't you? Yeah, it's an amazing coincidence. <laughs> Go on, explain. Stephen, explain. Oh, okay, so uh, Al is in a band called Abel Gantz, um, and they are a sort of progressive rock band. Sorry, sorry for saying sort of Al, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, we are we are an outlier in the progressive. Yeah, you're you're an, you're an outlier, and I, I I run a couple of festivals a year called the Winter, Winter's End and Summer's End festivals in Chepstow, and this time last year, hmm. Abel Gantz were playing that festival. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. On this, day, was it actually on this day? Last no, it was year? actually on my birthday. It was on your birthday okay. last oh, year. Good. Yeah. So yeah, you got so. one coming up soon, haven't you? Soon. Uh, yes, it's next weekend in Chepstow. Uh, all ticket types still available. Right. <laughs> and who who was the headliners? Uh, uh, we've got Oliver Waitman and his band playing. Actually, oh, okay. The right. son of Rick. Son, of, the son of Rick, who was also in Yes for a uh, for a while himself. He's his new band are playing. It's a kind of one-off appearance. They're rehearsing specially, uh, um, specially for it. Uh, we've got a band called The Fists and The Dead. Uh, and I've completely forgotten who else is playing. Oh, okay. Well, so tickets still available. Uh, yeah, winters yeah. End.co.uk. All right. Okay. Thank you. Zop, Zop are playing it as well. They played our Zop festival. Playing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they played yeah. our um, Probably Before Christmas last year. And never Everybody's got a festival, Mark. Don't you think you're, you're <laughs> no, really no. missing out here? <laughs> Is this an excuse to dig out uh, very, very cultish old prog T-shirts then? Presumably there's some quite interesting uh, gear um, yeah. being there. Yeah, yeah, we do, yeah. We, do, we, do, we do see a few. Uh, obviously, we do, we, we do a T-shirt each year, uh, well, twice a year. So we see a lot of our own T-shirts. Oh, that's nice. Uh, going back uh, next year, the Summer's End Festival will, will, be, it's, will be the 20th. In 2025. Wow. Amazing. Well, God, that's extraordinary. <laughs> well done. All so look, it, as it's you're traditional writing a book these... about a Yes album, isn't that right? Sorry? You're writing a book about a Yes album, 90125? Uh, I am, yeah. In fact, that's my my topic for for, for discussion. Yes, go on. I mean, go on. Specifically, but, the, but, but a topic that comes from the production of that album. Yeah, in fact, I've got it. That's the, uh, that's the album. And uh, I did a piece for Prog Magazine. About nine hundred two, nine hundred one two five at the end of last yeah. year, and that sparked off more research and more, uh, more discussion. It's a very, in itself, it's a very uh, interesting album. Though it's not one of those albums that people think of when they think of the sort of great Yes albums because it's from the eighties. Um, but the way it, the way it was pulled together is very contrived. It was pulled together in lots and lots of different stages, including John Anderson coming back into the band right at the last minute. And fiddling around with the album and making it a lot better, to be honest. So, so my subject for today t- was other albums that are very contrived but still sounded out re- s- turned out really good in the end. I've got a really good nomination for this. Actually. Okay, I've, got, I've got it here, and it actually has a yes connection, which I only right. realised after I'd chosen it, and that is Simon and Garfunkel's bookends, and the yes connection is is they have. This is where they did America. Of course. Which, yeah. Yes, of yeah. course, used to feature as part of their stage act, this fantastic kind of stretched out version of America. Anyway, Bookends, I was just reading about this, it was recorded over a period of about two years and the huge amounts of mucking about. And when CBS signed Simon and Garfunkel, they made the mistake of saying that they would cover all recording costs because they thought, folk duo, how much money can that cost? Yeah. 
Because Simon de Garfunkel think, well, great, we're going to get string quartets here, we're going to get all our mates in or whatever. It ended up costing a fortune. And they did it over a long period of two years. It's got all kinds of strange things. It's got recordings of elderly people in old people's homes, all kinds of stuff. But it hangs together for three reasons. And do you know what those three reasons are? One is America on side one, which is one of the greatest Simon and Garfunkel songs. The other is Mrs. Robinson on side two. And the third thing is that cover picture taken by Richard Avedon. It just became, you know, kind of the iconic photograph of Simon and Garfunkel. So that's my nomination of a record that was a, a mess as they made it. And in many ways still is a mess, but is held together by you know, a, a couple of songs, which I suppose is the case with the Yes album, isn't it? If you have one huge song, you know, it ends up justifying absolutely everything else. Yes, well, obviously that was identified by Trevor Horn, obviously who, produ- who produced it very early on as being the hit, though Trevor Rabin, the guitarist, says, well, he always thought that was going to be a hit. Um, and isn't uh, a lovely the whole story album about how- was... Uh, Trevor Horn heard that it was it was on a, a demo tape or something, wasn't it? And it was just still running, and he heard it play in the studio and thought, "Now that, that is something we can work on." And that the rest yes, uh, it was persuading. A, it was at a listening session in Los, in, in Los Angeles, and the whole band were, were were actually listening to Yes tracks. And Trevor Horn was going through all these kind of very like eighties sounding rock songs and thinking, "Oh, that they're not great." <laughs> yeah, uh, and then he he stumbled across this song. Um, Trevor Rabin actually, who I've, I've spoken to about this, actually uh, disagrees slightly with that interpretation. So it's all I'm they sure always it's all, do. They yeah, always yeah. do. <laughs> People are just just reinterpreting the same situation. I'm totally sure of it's sure absolutely of the case because people always think in any situation. We're always talking. Mark and I were talking about it the other day. You always think you're the active participant. Yeah. And what you don't realise is you're the passive participant at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're yeah, yeah. A, what happens is a consequence of the actions of loads of people, and you never manage to work out exactly exactly how it might be. So, Al, you've got you're you're in a, a, a Kate Bush tri- tribute act. Is that right? Yes, yes. I mean, I've been following this band Cloud Busting for many years on social media, and uh, last year they put a thing out that they were looking for a keyboard player. You know, I live in yeah. Scotland, and they're all based down south. So I sent them an email off. They basically said, "I love our music. I love the music since I was fourteen. I know the songs inside out. I don't know the notes, but you know, if you want to give me a shout, give me a shout. And by the way, I'm not a twat." So um, I sent all that off, and I, obviously the last part's a subjective thing. Right. Um, they, they, <laughs> they, they, but uh, they came back, I got an audition, and uh, I'm now one of the keyboard players. You know, They've got a guy called Matt Bowers who does most of the work, and I do the gigs he can't cover. Um, yeah, and... And they, they, and they, they stay the best down in England, here. are they? Uh, well, kind of all over the place in the south oh, of right. England. So, I mean, my next gig with them is on the 11th in Weymouth, then we're in Wolverhampton on the 12th of April, and then we're in Torquay on the 13th, and I'm picking up some gigs next month as well. Um, it's a very lonely place, being the keyboard player in the Cape Bush Tribute Band, because, you know, you are very exposed. There's absolutely no safety net in a lot of these songs. It's just piano and voice. Yeah. Um, but the sort of log I wanted to throw in the fire is obviously when I got this gig, I started doing my due diligence and uh, looking through <laughs> all huge. the... Yeah, <laughs> looking through all the uh, the sort of old interviews and stuff like that. And lo and behold, who pops up on some of the old interviews? But two rather cherubic-looking young men oh, yeah. who bear more than a passing resemblance to you two. Well, yeah. we well, we interviewed her. I think it might have been about, gosh, 1982 or something. I think we were in For the Dreaming album. And all yeah. I can remember the Dreaming, yeah, yeah. Didn't want to, she was promoting a tour, and she didn't particularly want to do it. And they made a deal with her. They said that we will hire the guards' van of the train, especially for you, and you can then rehearse your dance routine. She was doing a video. She on the way up, she was doing a video shoot. That's right. And that, I think, was the hook. And we only had about two and a half minutes with her. And I, I, it was quite difficult, wasn't it? A live television interview, wasn't yeah. it? I can't imagine we got much out of her, apart from fact that this is what Kate Bush sounds and looks like. And here she is talking, which was a rare thing in itself. Can you remember any great revelations? I can't particularly. Um... Isn't that the record's got Rolf Harris on it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Did you redo? So, summarily excised from the record back in, I think, 2018. You know, oh, was it really? 
She got her son to cover it. Um, she got her son to do all the parts. Oh, oh really? Oh, it's it was re-recorded. Yeah. I well, see, this is is quite interesting, actually. As a, as a friend, friend of Mark and Mark's and myself called Lucas Hare, uh, and Lucas doesn't believe in streaming services for anything, either film or music, because he says basically over a long period of time everything gets re-edited. You know what I mean to shoot to suit the turn of of the people who are in charge of these things, and I suppose that's a kind of case of that's that's very much a case in point. Now, get yeah, Kate Bush. I um yeah, I'd completely forgotten about this for years and years and years. And then I had the odd experience that I have occasionally. Somebody drops me an email saying I've just been watching an interview you did with Tonto, and I always go. I never met them in my life. No <laughs> recollection whatsoever. And then they send me the link, and you go, oh, crikey, yes, that is me, you know. And, uh, of course, what, uh, what I don't think anybody would have predicted back then, 82 or whatever Mark says it's f- over 40 years ago, was just that, that, that her star would rise all over again over a really long period of time, which is, you know, certainly seems to be the case now. See, um, I, I, th- I think she's a queen of prog. I think Kate Bush is a prog rock artist, fundamentally. She's a book definition of prog. I mean, she she started out with two songs about ghosts, effectively. Yeah. You know, yeah. and she's not afraid to use different voices. She's not afraid to use literary references. She's just not afraid to be her. Um, yeah, she, she is the queen of prog. Well, as well, I, I once interviewed her brother, uh, uh, John Carter Bush, John and he had Carter a book Bush. of photographs out about her, and I thought that was I think your point's probably true because the book you've probably seen it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's just these pictures of them growing up. It was at East Wickham Farm, yeah. And it, from the age of five, she seems to be permanently in fancy dress. She's permanently spinning around some garden somewhere with a a lute or some early kind of <laughs> very <laughs> primitive kind of uh, you know keyboard instrument, and living in this complete kind of prog Tolkienian fantasy. It's just wonderful, really. And you realise she was always like that, you know, and it all just took off when she was 15, 16. So they, there you go. She's the original original prog artist, and uh, and sometimes great albums come out of out of very confused circumstances, as in the case of Yes and Simon and Garfunkel, and you can no doubt supply your others if you've got them. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Happy birthday, whenever it is, whenever it was, and uh, and many more of them. Many more. See you next year. Everybody, say goodbye. It's the end of the podcast. Say goodbye, Al. Goodbye, Bye. Al. Goodbye, Stephen. <laughs> goodbye, Stephen. <laughs> it's the Waltons, yes. isn't it? <laughs> yes. Good night, John Boy. Say good night, John This Boy. podcast was brought to you by The Word. And-